We have here for review this Arendelle 1723 speakers. They have a real nice magnetic grill, eight inch drivers, a nice waveguide tweeter. See how that magnetic grill just pops right on there. It's adjustable to the position you want. The logo is magnetic. You can take that off if you don't prefer to have a badge on your speaker. Nice binding posts. You got a phone plug insert. Changes the tuning between sealed and ported. Top and bottom, two plugs, one there and one here. It's got a very nice finish, so I'm resting on my hand on the speaker to put it in. You can see that it has a almost like a silk paint job on it. Again, same thing over here. Nice magnetic grill, quality made steel. Tuning is down to the 30 hertz range. You can see that these things are really smooth finish. Like that's dust in my room from just a week worth of use. At this point, I'd like to dive right into the listening test. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about the equipment. So this is the Arendelle 1723 monitor THX speaker. It's got two eight inch drivers and a single 28 millimeter soft dome tweeter. If the crossover point between the woofer and the tweeter is 1500 Hertz, it's got an 89 dB sensitivity and the port tune is a low 30 hertz range. It's rated for 400 watt RMS, which is a good pairing to the amplifier we're gonna use. The Crown XLS 402, it puts out 400 watts per channel at four ohm. And the processor we're gonna be using for the source is the Marantz AV10. It's a current generation AV flagship. The speakers are just over 10 foot wide and it's about 10 foot back to the main listening position. So we're in that proverbial golden triangle that audiophiles love. The room's about 24 foot deep, by 18 foot wide, it's asymmetrical and opens up in the rear. I ran Odyssey to set distances and SPL trims and then I turned it off. So you can see in that first screenshot that the distances were 9.7 and 9.8 feet as calculated by Odyssey. You can subsequently see that Odyssey is completely turned off and that there are no graphic equalizer settings either. So this is hooked up just as a left-right pair for stereo music listening. I'm listening to some royalty-free music on YouTube. I wanted to show you kind of what they sound like. This is just through an iPhone. It's not gonna be a professional recording of, by any means, but it's uh, just a little chance to kind of hear what they sound like. Now I got a 60 Hertz crossover. I prefer 90 because I like my silver sound a little bit more bass, but just to kind of get more out of the speakers here. Switch uh, another genre of royalty free music. Switching genres again. You can see all these things are within the same range of each other. We're just trying to show that we're about 75 dB. I would trust the Omnimic over the SPL meters. The Omnimic reads maybe a dB less than the SPL meters, but that's where we're gonna start. So we have our volume set. You can see that the channel trims are at negative five. I've done it for both channels. They're both matched. We're going to proceed with the sweeps. 
What I want to show here is the left speaker is playing. This sound meter says 89.7 dB max, fast dBC read. This meter says 88.2 max, C uh, rated. And my Omni mic, if I can get it to focus in here, says 86 dB max. So my Omni mic's reading a couple dBs less than these SPL meters. They're all on the same plane. Omni mic's a little bit off the furniture. The SPL meters are on the furniture. I just wanted to show you that they are all reading in the same ballpark within plus or minus two or three dB. So what we're gonna do here is some compression sweep testing. You use compression sweeps to determine the headroom, the dynamic headroom of your speaker. What you do is you plot a point and then an arbitrary volume and you increase it by a certain amount of dB. In this case, we did five dB. And I've already done these tests, but I wanna show you how to do them in real time. What we're gonna do is establish a baseline. We're gonna increase the frequency response sweep in real time analysis by five dB at a time until we start encountering that the frequency response sweeps do not go up in uniformity. This can happen in two different locations, typically. It can happen at the base end of the spectrum or it can happen at the uh, high frequency range of the spectrum. If it's on the low end, on the subwoofer side or on the woofer side, you either run out of displacement on your drivers, there's not enough of them or they're too small, You've got some port chuffing, which is happening because your port volumes are too small, and so you get like a wind noise or a, like a chuffing sound coming out of your ports. Um, or you're just out of power on your amp and that can't go any louder and there's no bad sounds, but it just doesn't go up anymore. I'm not too worried about that end because your subwoofers that you have in your room will take care of working that. At the higher frequencies, when you start seeing uh, compression, it's because the driver is getting hot. Tweeters are typically not rated for very much power compared to the woofers or the, or the mid-range drivers in the speakers. And as they start to heat up, they start to lose their dynamic headroom. You'll see on this top line that is a 100 dB level that we're actually losing headroom. We're no longer increasing in uniformity at this 100 dB level. We're actually, here's 95, here's 90, here's 85. We're actually down to 85 dB, uh, below 85 on that last sweep. What you'll notice when these sweeps first kick off Every sweep will look in uniform for the first couple sweeps in the real time. They're like, they do a sweep, sweep, sweep with the Omnilike software. It's about that frequency or that, that speed. That first sweep or two will be in uniform. As that driver starts getting hot, that will start coming down because you're running out of headroom. Your, your, your driver is getting warm. It's saying, I'm not happy playing this. It's going to back down. If you stop and you pause for 30 seconds and you resume, your, your frequency response sweep will once again be high. Does this matter? Is it audible? It may not be audible in this case because we're starting at 20,000 hertz uh, where we're starting to see these sweeps. Maybe it's down at 15,000 hertz where you're kind of encountering it. The problem is it doesn't stay there. If you're in an extended scene that has like dynamic volume, like I say a book of Eli, like uh, the town center gunfight or maybe the gravity sweep, sine wave sweep at the beginning of the gravity movie, uh, those types of clips would have extended energy being required for the speaker. And as this gets hot, that knee where this starts to fold down would move to the left into an audible range where you would hear. So maybe it's at 6,000 hertz or 7,000 hertz or 8,000 hertz instead of being at 15,000 hertz where you see it. That does become audible. And the way I will tell you that it becomes audible is if you think about an X curve at a cinema, maybe your processor from Onkyo or Denon or Moran's has an X curve filter. That starts at about a 12,000 hertz range right here and it rolls it off typically. When you engage the X filter or turn it on or off, toggle it on or off, you'll hear a difference. When you have this kind of compression happening, it's almost like involuntarily engaging an X filter, and that's not necessarily desirable if your desire is to have reference level THX commercial cinema type volumes in your home theater. THX reference asks for 105 dB from every speaker to the main listening position. So it's interesting, these speakers are THX reference capable I am not measuring them as such according to their certification, as you can see in this sweep. I'm actually seeing that they're starting to roll off here in the 95 dB sweep, for sure. You can see that they're below that uh, metric. All right, so I've got this set up. Uh, the mic is 10 foot away from the speakers. We're gonna be doing some sweeps. The crossover's at 80 hertz, but the subs are off. So it's behaving as if the crossover 
had subs integrated, but the subs are just disabled so that we don't influence the frequency spot sweeps. Already captured the first one. This is our baseline. The volume on the AV10 processor is immaterial because we're not going to be using that as a reference. We're actually just seeing what the speakers can do themselves. And we're just gonna be going up 5 dB and make sure it's in parallel, and then we'll do it again. So I'll first turn this on. You'll see that that blue line will match the red save line exactly, and we'll go from there. So here's our sweep. Blue line overlays the, over, the red line. Let me save this. Okay, we're gonna increase the volume to 5 dB. that we've taken so far. So we are starting to see a little bit of compression already. We're not seeing anything crazy yet, but you can see that that tweeter is starting to roll off. It's starting to, it's starting to say that's a little bit more than I want to play with as far as volume. I don't see anything at like, um, you know, 10 kilohertz looks good, 2 kilohertz looks good, 200 kilohertz or 200 hertz looks good. Like everything looks good except for the very highest end. So let's go up another 5 dB. We're not going to hurt anything at this point. Okay, I've given the speaker a couple minutes to cool down here so we're not getting anything hot. And I'm going to kick it off. I've got 5 dB more on the volume. We're going to see where that puts us. So let's go ahead and start the track. So stop the track. I'm going to save this average. Uh-oh, we're in trouble, and I'm done with my test. Do you see this last line over here? Do you see how it's trailing off? That tweeter's not happy. That effectively means we're not going to get any more volume out of it without risking damaging the speaker. It looks pretty good beyond that. You see at 100 hertz, we've lost a little bit of ground at 100 hertz, but nothing too remarkable to worry about. We lost a little bit of ground at 200 hertz, but nothing terribly remarkable. It's mostly in uniform until you get up to above, uh, let's say about 12 or 13,000 hertz. I can give you an exact number here. Right here's where it starts failing off. So that's about 12 and a half in that realm that that tweeter just can't keep up. Now, let's, let's talk about what this means. THX reference asks that you have 105 dB at your seats. If it's asking for 105 dB, that's this line right here. You can see this line going across all the way on the left side. It says 105 dB there. We're not even close to 105. So to put it bluntly, this speaker is not THX reference capable, not at 10 foot. Most people's home theater rooms are probably 10 foot. So I'm going to classify this as kind of a moderate, level listening speaker. You're not going to get huge cinema sound out of it. It can't do it because of the tweeter. Now just to validate this, I'm going to go ahead and do this same test with the other speaker and make sure there's just nothing wrong with this particular speaker. But this is a pretty good indication there's a problem. If I took my pro audio speakers and did the same test, I would be able to go up to 105 dB plus because they're capable, the JBL CBTs that I have in here are capable of 125 dB, 122 dB, depending on the crossover mode you choose. 
And so they have plenty of headroom for about 10 dB of fall off at the listing position to still hit 105. They could probably hit close to 115 at the listing position. So it's kind of the difference between a pro audio and an audiophile speaker. There's a lot more to, to dig into this level if you want to talk about it. We can talk about it on the Usman podcast or we can talk about it in another format. But basically, if you want unaltered sound as the director intends, your speaker needs to be able to deliver that sound. And if it can't, then you'll see what you're seeing in this graph. So let's load up the other curves and let's see how they look. So here's our baseline right, and this is all the way to the plus 10 dB. Yep. So it's not just that speaker. You notice on that right hand side that it's starting to come down. It needs to be about another 5 dB higher actually in order to have um, maintained a parallel frequency response. So yeah, we're losing ground. I'll do one more sweep just to make sure it behaves the same way. I'm going to go up 5 dB more. And we're going to let this run. And we'll get an average, a new average. So we'll see how that looks. It's probably going to do the exact same thing as the other one is our hypothesis. You know, I didn't grab it uh, after it started getting warm, so you can see that it actually looks higher than what it ended on. But if I'm going to play that again, um, let me get a different average because it doesn't really represent what we saw. It was on its way down still. So we're going to clear this average. We're going to run that again. Again, it's not going to hurt anything unless you let this run long term. You can watch that thing drop on the right hand side. So one. what we wanted to see here you can see on that right hand side that the the 20 hertz side of the frequency response is just dropping off and it would continue to drop off it would actually start inverting below the other frequency responses that tweeter got too hot so um yeah i mean that's just what it is all right i'm going to save these responses off and we'll resume our testing I'd like to talk about this a little bit more. I've used the OmniMic software to overlay the left and right speaker, and you can see that the red lines coincide with the orange top line where the compression sweeps are concerned, and the blue lines coincide with the purple line as the top line. You can see at the 20 kilohertz end of the spectrum that these Arendelle 1723 THX monitors do not want to go over about 85 dB. Um, that's with these compression sweeps where you're kind of continually hitting it, but it doesn't take very long before they start dropping down. You'll notice in my live sweeps that the first sweep might be in parallel, and then that right side just starts dropping. I didn't think that that seemed right to me to be THX certified and not be a full band with speaker, so I reached out to Arendelle and asked them the question. Can you recreate this in the lab? Is this something you would expect to see? I said, I'm not terribly surprised because they're soft dome tweeters, and I haven't tested a soft dome tweeter that's capable of going to reference yet, uh, unless there's multiples. But I didn't know how this was supposed to work with these Arendelles. Arendelle wrote back and said, hey, we are able to recreate that in our lab, but only at higher SPLs than what you were testing. Um, I don't know what that means. I don't know how long they were actually doing the sweeps, but you saw in mind that it drops off after just a few sweeps, it starts dropping down. Relevant? Maybe. Let's talk about Book of Eli. I've tested that with high efficiency speakers, 98 dB sensitive speakers, and there are gunshots that hit 105 dB repeatedly in that Book of Eli town shootout. Not subs. Subs are turned off. Just testing the speakers. So let's talk about that type of scene. If you had a scene where there were repetitive gunshots happening, maybe the first one you have full dynamic range, and then as you hit multiple gunshots beyond that, if there's not enough time between them, you might start losing full bandwidth gunshot reproduction at THX levels as those gunshots repeat. That isn't a big deal if you're not going to listen at reference volume or you don't expect commercial cinema volume, but some people do. I do. I pride myself on that in my cinema. So it's something to consider. If you're only going to listen at negative 10, the problem becomes less. If you're only going to listen at negative 20 dB from reference, it probably doesn't matter at all. But I just want to go back to the X cinema thought. If you turn on the X Cinema filter on your processor or your AVR, you'll probably notice a difference. I certainly can. And so, to me, 
by having these things roll off on the high frequencies, it's almost like you're involuntarily turning on an X filter. And that's not my preference for my speaker. In order to be very thorough, I tested again with shorter sweeps and a longer time between sweeps. And I wanted to show you those results here in a moment. Also, in that last test, as I even tried to go up to THX volume with the whole speaker, I was not able to get there. There was a bad mechanical sound when I hit that 105 dB sweep and I felt uncomfortable pursuing further. Okay, the next sweep will start to get us at the one kilohertz mark over uh, or to the 105 dB line. And that'll be of interest because that is THX reference. Uh, one kilohertz tone-ish, 800 hertz to 2000 hertz, that type of range, which is definitely where we're at, at 105 dB. Um, we're getting, we're closing in on that. So let's take a look. Go ahead and start the sweep and we'll raise the volume. Stop, stop. I was hearing bad noises coming from the speaker. So we're cutting that out short. We're not going to continue. We didn't blow a driver. We're just out of headroom. It's making a bad sound. I backed it off at the very beginning when it started making a bad sound. We don't want to repeat this test. Now you can see, as I mentioned, that the bass is compressing. You can see that we're on the 75 or the 70 dB line, the 75 dB line, the 80 dB line. But at a certain point, we're no longer on the line as we went up. We're actually 3 dB down or so here at 30 hertz. But again, I'm not terribly worried about that because the subwoofer will kind of uh, will power through that for you. So you don't have to worry about that so much with your speakers. This part here, though, I do begin to worry about because that becomes audible as a clip, as a long-running clip with dynamic highlights becomes, uh, is being asked to play, you're going to start losing those upper frequencies. As an older man, you probably don't hear above six or 10,000 hertz, depending on your age. Maybe an 80-year-old man only hears to 6,000 hertz. Maybe a 60-year-old man only hears to 10,000 hertz. I'm 44, I can hear to 15,000 hertz. Maybe if you're 20, you can hear to 18,000 hertz. If you're a young kid, you might hear to 20,000 hertz. Our, our hearing is lost as we age. There's nothing you can do about it, even if you're very protective with your hearing. It just will uh, begin to fail or to hear the higher frequencies as you age. But uh, this is what compression sweep testing is. We're gonna go ahead and move on to show you what the port tune of these speakers is. What we're gonna do right here is uh, the port tune testing. So the Arendelles are supposed to be 34, D, uh, 34 hertz port tuned with two vents open. We have the vents completely open, they're not blocked. If we blocked them, they would change the port tune of the cabinet. We don't want to do that for this test. We got an online test tone generator. It's gonna start at 50 hertz. The volume is somewhat arbitrary. I just put it at negative 23 main listening volume. And the, then the frequency is starting at 50 hertz. What we're gonna do is push play. You're gonna see that the rice begins to shake at any frequency that's not port tuned. And at port tuned, the box becomes what's creating the SPL from the drivers. So at port tuned on the box, you're gonna see the rice stop moving. That's how you can determine a true port tune of a speaker visually. So here, we're gonna push play. Again, this is 50 hertz, and we're gonna just drop it. Uh, if Tim can focus in on the computer screen and the rice at the same time, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34. So that was the port tune they said, plus or minus 3 dB. I'm gonna go ahead and lower alert. Here's 33, the rice is barely moving. Here's 32, the rice has stopped moving. All the sound, the subs are off in the room, so if you can hear this through the iPhone camera, that's all being produced by these Arendelles. It's a pretty good amount of bass in here, actually, for the volume given. It's, uh, I had to double check my subs weren't on. But you can see the port tune is 32. Now we might have plus or minus a, deep, uh, a frequency of hertz here before it starts activating again. Here's 31, there's, again, no activation there. 30, 29, it's starting to activate again. So we had about a three dB, uh, I'm sorry. So we had about a three hertz frequency range where it was not activating the rice. And as I go lower, you're gonna start the drivers are going to unload because it's below port tune of the ports, and you're actually going to lose control of the woofers pretty quick at this point, so I'm not going to go real low, but here's 27 hertz, here's 26 hertz, here's 25 hertz, and we're going to stop. We don't want to damage those woofers. We weren't anywhere near the excursion, but that's not the point in this video. We wanted to find port tune, and we found port tune at about, I'm going to say it's about 31, because 33 vibrates, 32 doesn't. 
31 doesn't, 30 doesn't, and 29 does. So the port tune of this cabinet is about 31 hertz. So actually it's specified maybe even a little lower than Arendell says. That's a good thing. The last thing I wanted to show you is that the near field measurements of a speaker are much smoother, a nice flat frequency response as compared to your sitting area. And the reason that is, is because the audio waves that are coming out of the speaker, they are not coming out directly and only to the chair. They're coming off the sides in a dispersion pattern. They're hitting the corners of the room. They're hitting the sides of the room and they're bouncing around creating modes and nulls. Modes being a raise and nulls being a dip. So if you saw when I was doing the frequency response compression sweeping here, you might have noticed that there was a there was not a perfect uniform line. If you were measuring in a giant gymnasium with these speakers in the center, or if you were in a field, your frequency response would be smoother at distance than it would be in a typical home theater room. My room is 18 foot wide in the front here by about 24 foot depth. It's not symmetrical. It dips out over here on the right hand side, um, but it causes different interactions with the speaker waves. So that's why you don't get a perfectly smooth frequency response at seats. So what I'm gonna show you I'm going to start a sweep and I'm going to start close to speaker and I want you to kind of watch the frequency response on the screen and watch how it interacts as I interact with the room as I step back. I'm going to start the sweep. I'm going to walk up to the speaker. You can see that it gets smoother as I get close, which would be like a near field mic measurement. This is how they're designing the speaker. As I get really close to the tweeter, you're going to see uh, some interaction with the speaker and the driver combining, but as I get out, about one meter should combine real nicely. So about three feet, you're going to get your flattest response or so. And then as I go out towards the seats, you're going to see that line become not as smooth, potentially, especially if you change um, position left, right, and center. They will not be the same because it's interacting with the room. So you can see right here a little mode popped up but there's a null at 180 that's just room dependent now the null is at 200 hertz continue to move this back continue to move this back and here would be like where your head is at you can see that's not as smooth as up close it still looks pretty good it's pretty nice and flat uh, but not as good as it up close so that's just the room interactions so tim and i spent the afternoon listening to the arendelles and kind of comparing what they sounded like in the room to uh, different types of music that we enjoyed and wanted to relay our experiences. Also even had a little bit of bonus time listening to them compared to the JBLs. So I've had the Arendelles since M-Wave uh, this summer in July timeframe. They were sent to me by the company. Uh, we showed them to the premium ticket holder guests and there was good rapport there. People seemed to enjoy them. They were upstairs in the living room powered by an Onkyo Pre-Pro, flagship Pre-Pro with a crown amp. In today's testing we used a Marantz AV10 Pre-Pro with a Crown XLS402 amp, that same amp they listened to previously. And um, I've enjoyed my time with them. They, I think they sound enjoyable for music. They're very neutral and transparent and they kind of just disappear in the background. I don't think they're as lively as a sound or as um, maybe fun as a sound is what I would personally prefer. The Airedale 1723 cabinet is very sturdy. It's very heavy. The, the, the speaker itself is uh, just very, very solid, like the, the build quality and so forth. So that's a nice feature. Pro Audio stuff's meant to be lightweight, meant to be carried around. It's just a plastic uh, enclosure, and those tend to sometimes have some resonances. So, so there's a plus there for Arendelle for that reason. Pro Audio is also what I'm used to in the sense of listening, and I, and I feel like there's kind of a fun live sound that Pro Audio brings to the equation. Um, certainly higher SPL capability, that kind of thing. I listen to a lot of stuff at reference. I felt like that was missing a little bit in the Arendelle in my experience. Tim, what'd you think? I, I agree on most accounts. Uh, it's a very neutral sounding speaker. Um, I also agree they're not as lively or as fun of a speaker as maybe I'm more used to. My takeaway, I, I had a good time. I don't know the the I'm not as nitty gritty on the specs or the price of the speakers, so I'm more of a unbiased opinion because coming into this completely blind. But at the same time, like, it, it wouldn't be the speaker I took home today. You know, at the end of the day, a speaker preference is subjective. What I like, what Tim likes, what you like, they're all going to be different. And that's okay. All going to have our own preferences. 
I prefer a pro audio type speaker. Uh, Tim has his clips that he really enjoys. And then, you know, the next guy might like an audiophile speaker. There's nothing wrong with any of those choices. All these speakers are going to have a little different sound, a little different characteristics that you might enjoy. And uh, you just pick what you like, pursue from there. I found that JBL, uh, the pro audio speakers that I have, and even some just like little battery operated Eon series that I have, every time I move from the Arendelle back to like the JBL, I thought, here's the fun. I just enjoy that type of sound better, that live pro audio sound. Tim said he liked listening to him too. He just said that he liked what he has better. Nothing wrong with that. Nobody's going to say that these are bad speakers. The limitation we saw in the compression testing with the soft dome tweeter is going to be pretty similar to any speaker with a single soft dome tweeter. I don't know of a design or I haven't run across one yet that can hit reference level volume with a single soft dome tweeter. That's why my JBL CBTs have 16 of them. Or you go to a high sensitivity compression driver that's horn loaded or maybe even a high sensitivity coax. If you want those commercial theater volumes, that's where you go. Perhaps you're not one that wants to listen loud. Perhaps you just want a well-built, quality-made speaker with a 10-year warranty and you want it to be transparent, neutral, with a nice grill and all the things that Arendelle offers. Those are all legitimate characteristics. And a reviewer then is bringing their own biases and preferences into the mix. I've had my JBL CPT 70 j ones for about five years, and I know what they sound like, and I really like their sound, so that's my bias. Also, another thing that's kind of difficult in this day and age, I have 15 matching speakers, 15 JBL CBT 70 j one and I listen to all my music upmixed with Dolby Surround or even Spatial Audio with Dolby Atmos. I listen to music nearly every day, and with that experience being my daily norm, it's pretty hard to go back to two-channel if I'm being honest. My JBL CBT 70 j ones cost almost the exact same amount as the Arendelle, and my affection belongs to the JBL. The next guy that listens to these speakers might prefer the Arendelle, and that's totally fine. I see that kind of stuff all the time in the hobby. Blind test, two guys sitting right next to each other. One prefers one speaker, the other next. So what I'm saying is take my opinion with a grain of salt. Take Tim's opinion with a grain of salt. Heck, take any reviewer's opinion with a grain of salt unless you've heard them yourself. Arendelle makes that part of it easy with their 60-day in-home trial. Buy a set. Here for yourself. Let me know in the comments what you think. Thanks for listening, and until next time.